paid too much for grazing. It was my pasture. But the opportunity cost that I could get someone else in to pay for custom grazing made it too expensive for my cow. So I sold my cows, and I've been custom grazing ever since. Uh, I get a lot of flack, uh, social media, everything about how I don't have any skin in the game. Okay. Uh, my argument is he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If any of you understand that. Uh, to me, I'm just a shepherd. I use the cattle as a tool to manage the land. Right? My job is to sequester carbon and build ecosystems. And the, the cattle are a tool. I don't need to own them to have that happen. And uh, just the running the margins on them in my environment over the years has just never penciled. Right? I can make a little bit of profit, a little bit of profit, and then you have one bad year like this year where hay is $250 a bale, and you just lost seven years worth of profit. So I've been very low risk in my custom grazing. Um, our land values are very high. Uh, BSE hit in 2003. Um, I've never looked back. I've thought a couple times about owning cows again. Every time I do the numbers, it's not close enough. It's not a good enough margin. So um, it's low risk. I don't have to worry about markets. I don't have to worry about prices. Um, my only risk is rain, and I can manage that. We're going to talk a little bit about the water cycle. Uh, Jim did a good job yesterday of that. I also have something called the Animal Keepers Act. Uh, there's some states that have something similar, but all the provinces of Canada have it. It's a legislated act that says, as an animal keeper, if some, my customer doesn't pay me, I can take his animals to auction and sell them and get my feedback. back. Okay, it's the best insurance you could ever imagine. And I don't pay any fees for it. There's no, no it's just a, a legislated act. So that keeps me uh, custom grazing, <coughs> just that alone. So. That's a very good security, good insurance program. So it's kind of kind of strange that a ranch, I've been ranching for 27 years and I've never owned a tractor and I have no cattle in probably 20, 25 years, 24 years. I also don't own the land. I live outside, about 45 minutes outside of the fifth largest city in Canada. Okay, what do you think the land value of your life? <coughs> pretty high. We've got acreage owners and city people moving out and the land values are just through the roof. Like agriculture can't pay for it. So I figured out how to lease all my land. So we, we're anywhere between 2,500 and 3,500 acres depending on the year. Uh, we lease summer pasture in, in multiple locations. We have multiple herds that we move around and uh, even uh, grain fields. Like in the fall, we've got four pieces of land this fall that we plan to graze. Uh, top dress some of them uh, with my drone. So we hopefully get a little bit growing here in the fall with some cover crops, but we are swath grazing and uh, residue grazing uh, four different fields this, this year on the herd. So I do have one herd that we keep year round. It's actually to keep my manager busy. Uh, he needs some extra work in the winter, so I brought in a herd for, for year round grazing. Um, but yeah, uh, kind of strange, I guess, in my environment that I don't own any land either. Ah, again, no skin in the game, eh? Darn it. I get criticized all the time. Alan Nation said years ago, uh, land is a good investment with after-tax dollars. If you're trying to do this out of cash flow, land is a terrible investment. But if you've got money sitting there, yeah, it's always gone up in value. Um, I, I do own some land, it's just not necessarily agricultural land. And we do have our investments, but not in agricultural land. Okay, here's another one, another paradigm. Academia told me years ago when, when I was in college, that it takes a hundred years to grow an inch of topsoil. Has anybody heard that before? Okay. I was talking to a leading researcher at our university here about less than a year ago, talking about carbon, a little discussion, and they, they kind of scoffed at me. Oh, but it takes a hundred years to grow an inch of topsoil. Right? This is a leading researcher in soil science who doesn't understand how we build soil. Um, so that kind of frustrates me. So I'm kind of going to blow that off the, the scale here today. Uh, years ago, Dr. Christine Jones came up and uh, did a tour around Alberta. She's from Australia. And uh, I couldn't believe what she was telling me. Because she's talking about carbon, the liquid carbon pathway. And why had I never heard of this before? In all my years going through college and, and all the education that I took, 
why had I never heard about this, about how we can um, sequester carbon through the plants. So I'm going to tell you a little story about a friend of mine, John Baptiste. We were really good friends. Wow, we would have been if I lived in 1600s. Um, he got arrested and thrown in jail for studying plants. They didn't like his results. So he had an experiment he did. He had a question, how do plants grow? The modern thinking at the time, so picture this in 1600s, the modern thinking at the time was that plants grow from eating the soil. Okay, so they use up the soil. That was the modern thinking. So he did an experiment. He took a large earthen pot, a big flower pot, dug a hole, put it in the ground, took 200 pounds, of, or sorry, took, took a bunch of soil, dehydrated it so it was dry, weighed out 200 pounds of it, put it in the large earthen pot, put it in the ground, planted a small willow tree, a sapling, covered it with a mesh so that nothing could blow in or blow out, and then he watered it. He put water on it. And every time it needed to be watered, he watered it. His experiment went on for five years. So at the end of five years, he didn't account for the leaves falling off, but he grew a tree. And at the end of five years, he pulled out the tree and he grew the product with 178 pounds of wood and a root that he pulled out, set it aside, pulled out the soil, dehydrated it again, and weighed it. He had almost exactly 200 pounds of topsoil. Okay. So his conclusion from the experiment that he got thrown in jail for was that plants grow from water. So he added, where did the tree come from? Carbon. Carbon. Where did that come from? <clears throat> from the air. The tree grew from the air, not the soil. So they did not like that. The, the, the scientists at the time didn't like that and threw them in jail. Okay. Every plant, every tree, every shrub, every weed on an elemental makeup is made up of mostly four elements. 45% carbon, 45% oxygen, 6% hydrogen, and 1.5% nitrogen. That's 97.5% of every plant comes from the air, not the soil. Why are we so hung up on what's in the soil? 2.5% we need to get from the soil. And every other element in the plant is less than 1%, and most of them are measured in parts per million. A very small amount we need from the soil. So he was thrown in jail for this. I honestly think more people should be thrown in jail today for what they do to their soil. Okay. So how do plants grow? Anybody ever heard the term exudation? The exudate? Photosynthesis pulls carbon out of the air. The only thing that does that is green plants. Okay. Turn, that, turn that carbon into glucose. The glucose pushes that down into the root system and pushes it out and feeds the soil organisms. Right? It's the glue that glues the particles together, the soil organisms. You've got silt, sand, and clay. We're gluing all those together, making good aggregation. We need that carbon, that liquid carbon pathway, as, as Dr. Christine Jones called it. So this is a, a soil sample or a so, soil profile from my place. This is where the University of Alberta came up and did a study that I'm going to talk about right away. Now, you see the little triangles coming down? Okay. Those are root systems digging down into our hard, hard clay. We have blue clay. They call it the Busby, Busby clay. Uh, if it gets wet and it's exposed, your rubber boots get to be about 30 pounds each. Okay, so we have a very solid clay base. Uh, but I'm pushing down, this is gray wooded soil. Right? We start with, this was forested area with nothing, there's no black topsoil. We've created black topsoil. Okay? Academia thinks that we, takes a, it takes 100 years to grow an inch of topsoil because they are thinking about the top, leaving residue and that decomposing and breaking down and forming topsoil from above. Okay? Most of that carbon is just cycling. Right? It, it volatilizes off, it's cycling. We need the residue. We talked about water holding capacity yesterday. We need that residue. We need to leave that on top. <coughs> That's not how we grow soil. It's not fast enough. If we can use that carbon pushing down through the exudate and grow it underneath, what we're doing is we're converting your base into topsoil. 
We're not building it on top, we're converting what's below. So if you have, have a sandy soil, turn it into topsoil. If you have a clay soil, turn it into topsoil with the root system. Okay, so that's what we've been doing here. So leaving residue on top, yes, it can be done very slow. Roots decay, right? Having them break down and sloughing off, that's gonna help. But that exudation is a much faster way to build topsoil. So how long do you think it'd take to build an inch of topsoil? 100 years? Two to three years. So this was the study that the University of Alberta came out. They called it AMP. I don't care what you call it. Adaptive multi paddock grazing is what they called it, so I'm okay with that. I call it an advanced grazing system of some kind. Right? Um, I'm not particular on the name. Um, AMP and non-AMP. So Previously, both these pieces of land were they're side by side. They had the same history. They were bulldozed about 50 years ago and left for pastures continuously grazed. Their rocks are rough and bumpy, and they're not, you know, not desirable for the grain farmer. That's for sure. But they were they were treated the same. 15 years before the end of the study, I took over one of them, and I started changing it. I started doing the advanced grazing. So this was us way up here in the very top left hand corner. The study was all across the prairies. There was, there was 30 different locations, and each one had a comparison, side-by-side uh, -side comparison. So that was us. So I just got the results from my branch. Uh, this is the soil plug from the two different places. Uh, it was 5.2 on the control, a continuous graze. We are now almost 11% soil organic carbon Okay, in 15 years. Uh, we now have an average of 10.8 inches of black topsoil. We're in a gray wooded soil zone. We started with nothing. They have basically nothing on their side. Like this is the top of the soil plug. There's no age horizon. So we've created that in 15 years. And you guys know there's a, such a thing as a carbon nitrogen ratio. As your carbon goes up, so does your nitrogen. Now we've doubled our nitrogen storage in our, in our soil. I haven't added any fertilizer, nothing other than cattle, urine, and manure in the last 20, 25 years. So we've created that, we've built that. 11 inches in 15 years, that's a lot faster than 100 years, right? Okay, if you don't believe that one, I got another one for you. We got a bale grazing study that we did 17 years ago. Uh, interesting, we've taken it 17 years ago, it was at 3%. And we've taken it up over 7% now on average. Interesting one about this, and I still don't know why, the carbon was higher, it was over 8% at the 12, or sorry, the 6 to 12 inch layer, and it was under that at the 0 to 6 inch layer. We have more carbon a little bit deeper than right on the surface. I don't know why yet, I'm still trying to figure that out. But it was consistent all the way across. You can see it in the soil plug, sort of. It's darker down here than it was up here. And that's what the test, test we did the 10 different plugs all the way around. The, this one's interesting too, because we have a bale grazing field that we did 17 years ago, and then we have a control right next to it. And it showed it was it was ahead. So the bale grazing field. Yes? One time bale grazing, One time bale grazing 17 years ago. We covered it really good, and then we just grazed it. Interesting thing about that is it did really well the, the first year. I mean, it was standing this tall, and the control was terrible still. Um, over the next couple of years, the clovers came into the non bale grazing one. And within 10 years, they looked the same. This one, the bale grazing went down a bit. This one came up and caught up. So, what I can do in one year with bale grazing took me about 10 with, with just managed grazing. But I can only bale graze on so many acres in a year, so you have to be able to do that. Anyway, so yes, we can grow a lot of topsoil. It's not, it doesn't take 100 years. So this is that same soil profile, and we went down to a neighbor's place. We had an experiment going on with kerns of wheat. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of kerns of wheat. We did a plot trial, and supposedly the root system on this kerns of wheat is really big. It's like six to eight feet deep. So after it was established for three years, I said, we gotta go take a hole. Let's go look at this, this wheat. And this was down in the black soil zone where they had their plots. $150 an acre to rent this land. This is the good grain land. Uh, went down there and we dug a hole. I, I wasn't very impressed with the root system. It was like, oh, well that's not that impressive. Maybe you can't dig through the clay as deep as wherever they did the, the 
trial before. But what I did see was the soil profile in this $150 an, hour, or $150 an acre land. I told the backhoe operator, I said, this is a zero-till grain farmer's field. We've got to be nice and careful here. Let's pull out the topsoil first, put it on a pile on this side, and then once we get the clay, we'll pull it up and put it this side so that we can put it back down in the right order, right? We couldn't tell the difference. We couldn't see a difference in any layers. Everything was the same color. This one was only 4% soil organic matter. I'm up to 11, and I'm in the cheap land with gray wooded soil, cattle country, nobody wants it. Um, and I've got a recording of a University of Alberta professor who came out to do our pasture walk. He uh, was our special guest. He showed up, he was prepared. He had every land map on the table explaining this and that and all the differences, the soil zones that were in, the piece of land, he wanted to know the exact piece of land we're going on. He knew exactly what it was supposed to be. He came out there and I dug a hole for him and he went down into that hole and he just, he was stumped. And I got it on recording, he said this, this 11 inches of topsoil is not supposed to be here. Something's wrong. Okay, so I am regenerating the land, okay? The grain farmer is degenerating it, right? Guess what happens as his carbon goes down? His nitrogen's going down with it, right? That carbon-nitrogen ratio. My nitrogen's going up. This is easy. It takes time, but this is easy. I didn't even know what I was doing. Guys like Jim told me to do this, and I did. I'm like, okay, let's do it. But now we're seeing some results from it, and it's very exciting for me. Uh, okay, can I, have, can I do a rant now? You guys okay if I do a rant? The whole world is focused on reducing carbon emissions, right? everybody and they're marketing it and they're selling it and they're 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 bragging about what you know by 2030 the airline company that we flew down here on i'm pretty sure they're one of the ones that are you know bragging that they're going to be carbon neutral by 2030 or 2040 or something are they ever going to do it they can't they can never it's a math equation why is this so difficult for society to be carbon neutral, you have to sequester as much carbon out of the atmosphere as you emit. It's pretty simple, isn't it? How many industries can sequester carbon? Maybe two or three. Forestry, agriculture. Okay, we have the ability to sequester carbon. We're the answer. We're not the. We're not guilty. You know, we're, we're not the the culprits here. Um, are we? sequestering more than we emit. Ah, darn it. We could be. We could be. Okay, we need to learn how to sequester more. Okay. I took a bit of a online test here a couple of years ago. Um, it was from the UK, so I'm not going to say it was super accurate in Canada. Um, maybe I didn't put all my numbers in, but it took me all day to go through this thing and figure it out. And I came back at 94% sequestration and 6% emissions. 50-50 would be carbon neutral. Okay. We have the ability to do this. Okay. The airline company doesn't. <laughs> they can't. Unless they buy a bunch of land and hire me to go fix it for them. Okay. So we can do this. Um, I don't burn a lot of diesel. Right? It, it was pretty detailed. It even talked about the batteries. Um, I'm, my, my farm is technically off-grid. Um, we have an off-grid system on the farm, and our house has solar panels on it, for, but it's tied to the grid. But it even talks about the batteries, and you know, because the, there, there's a huge environmental footprint on batteries. But that was included in here. The firewood you burn, the propane you use, the, the, the forested areas you may manage and maintain versus the grasslands that you maintain. <coughs> so in about 2008, I went to a, a session in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and they were talking about selling, uh, you know, selling carbon credits. I'm like, oh, what's this? This is interesting. And they were so far advanced that the grain farmers were already receiving checks for forty and fifty and sixty thousand dollars for carbon credits. I'm like, what? Where, where did I miss this? They were backdating it to two o two. I'm like, two o eight, two o seven, two o three. Oh my gosh, where's my check? I've been doing a great job sequestering carbon. I still haven't seen it. 
What year is it? <laughs> so I'm not holding my breath for carbon credits, but the idea is there, right? We are, we have the ability to do this. We can sequester carbon more than we emit. We just have to be aware of that. Um, sometimes people ask me, what is regenerative agriculture? Okay, and on the grain side or on the ranching side, the easiest way for me to explain that is it's a mentality shift. Okay, it's a mindset shift. Modern agriculture grows plants from the soil. Right? They, they have take a seed, they plant it, they put in fertilizer, it grows, and they harvest it off and sell it. They, they're growing plants from the soil. With regenerative agriculture, we're growing soil from the plants. <clears throat> See the difference? Right? My goal is to use those plants and to build my soil. That that's gonna, gonna correct a whole lot of issues we have in this in this world. We, we start to get carbon put into the soil, we start to get more water holding capacity. Get more water holding capacity, we get more biology. With the, we're using the plants to do that. And how do we manage the plants? Best way is with the livestock. And then the livestock, you also get the biology added. Okay, the herbivore has a symbiotic relationship with the soil, the soil biology. They add to it, the manure, the urine, uh, the phlegm, the saliva, there's even biology that falls off the hair color that builds that soil biology and gets that going. And the more different types of plants you have, the more biology you're going to have in the soil. So the, the monoculture is, uh, we've got to get away from that. And i got a bit of a quote, um, if you guys want to bear with me here. A monoculture is ugly. You guys want to repeat that with me, please? A monoculture is ugly. That wasn't very good. Come on. A monoculture is ugly, no matter how pretty it looks. You guys have heard that song, uh, She Ain't Pretty, She Just Looks That Way? Yeah. You know, all the wedding photos around canola. You guys have a little bit of canola here? Not at all? Okay. Well, the wedding pictures in Canada by, by canola drives me nuts. Yeah. Because canola is ugly to a bee. It's only got a flower for one part of the year. Um, another one. So this is this one, another friend of mine um, came up with this many, many years ago. The law of the minimum, kind of the weak link. Okay? In your soil test report, right, you get this back and they would try and tell you, okay, which is the most important nutrient to add, right, to, to bring this barrel up level. Okay, do you guys know from the picture what's the most important nutrient? Phosphorus? Water. Water, it's pouring out of the barrel. I love this barrel. <laughs> they don't even talk about it. I've had people argue that old water's not a nutrient. H2O, <laughs> P2O2, right? They're all elements. Water is definitely a nutrient. Uh, if you've got a soil test report that says you need to get X number of bushels or X number of pounds or tonnage of forage, you need to add 50 pounds of nitrogen. Equivalent to that 50 pounds of nitrogen, you need 10,000 pounds of water. What's the most important nutrient? Water. It's the only one I manage on my ranch. And if you get too much water, we still need to manage for it. We've got to get the infiltration working. We've got to hold on to, turn it into a sponge to hold what you need, and then allow the rest to, to uh, infiltrate away. We need those root systems to, to dig down deep. We need those plants. And if you're in a dry environment, boy, you want to hold on to as much as you can. As Jim said yesterday, that effective rainfall is what we need to be managing. I don't care what your actual rainfall is. I want what's your effective rainfall? What are you holding on to? So, another bit of a paradigm to break: uh, that we need fertilizer. I haven't used fertilizer in 25 years. Okay. Uh, the main ones I can get from the air for free. Okay, that's 97.5 percent I can get from the air. Every time the plant grows. And I get two to three gr plant growths every season. And 97.5% of that I can get from the air. Okay? The air we breathe is 78% nitrogen. Every breath you take, why would you ever buy any? Right? We need leggings. We need uh, plants and biology to be able to get it. Okay? Here's some more nutrients that we supposedly need. Uh, Joe Williams, he's another one of my rock stars. He, uh, this three random uh, fields in Saskatchewan that he pulled up. 
when you get a soil test report, they give you the available nutrients. Okay? When he takes soil tests, he gets the actual nutrients in the soil. The available and the actual are so different. Yeah, I don't know if you can read any of those. Uh, calcium, uh, 5,000 available, 38,000 or almost 39,000 actually in the soil. Magnesium, 400, 400, uh, available is 428, actual is 14,000. Why is there a difference between available and actual? Okay, here's another one just for your thing. <coughs> What do we need to, act to be able to get to that actual? We need biology. The biology makes it available. The problem is we've got dead soil with no biology, and of course it's all bound up and tied up. Okay? We need bacteria in the soil to make it available. There's an underground black market that's going on. Okay? It's controlled by the mob. Who's the mob? The plants. Plants of the mob because they control the currency. What's the currency? Sugar. Everybody wants sugar. So a bacteria will get a molecule of, say, copper, bring it to the plant, say, here's some copper in exchange for a molecule of sugar. Okay. Uh, mycorrhizae fungi, great, great friends of the, the mob. Uh, they trend in charge of transportation and dis distribution. They're moving stuff around, trading. Phosphorus is always bound up in the soil, right? Mycorrhizae fungi can get phosphorus. Their, their root systems or their the, the fungi system reaches out and grabs whatever they can and brings it back to the plant and trades them for some sugar. Okay. There's this underground black market going on. We don't need to buy fertility. It's there for us. 85 to 90 percent of plant nutrition is microbiotically mediated. We don't have a fertility issue in agriculture. We have a biological issue. Get the biology back and you don't need to buy fertilizer. Because the fertilizer you're putting on there is actually damaging your biology. We don't need it. So we talked about 97.5%. Every time we're growing plants, we're bringing in 97.5%. And livestock are very inefficient. You guys like math? I like math. I really like spreadsheets too, Jim. I like math. Of that 97.5%, 80% gets recycled out the back end. So 80% of that. So we're actually bringing in 78% of our nutrients every time we graze. We bring in 97, we're recycling 78 of them. What about that 2.5%? So we took 2.5 from the soil, but we recycled 80% of it. So 2% of it goes back. That means we're actually only exporting 0.5%. I can easily get that with a mineral package. You feed mineral to your cattle, you can easily get 0.5%. There's no reason why we need to be importing fertility in a ranching situation. We have it all, everything we need. So how do we do this? Real quick, how am I doing for time? Good? 10 minutes? We need to work on these five principles. Uh, I, number one, I work on building the water cycle. Most important thing, um, I help hold on to water to leaving residue, right? Reducing evaporation, reducing runoff, holding on to it. I also uh, try and block water. Most of agriculture is constantly draining, 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 draining. Um, a river system, right? Don't we? Call, do you guys down here? Do you call them uh, watersheds? The river watershed. Um, that's backwards thinking to me. To me, watershed is water shedding off, right? You shed water off a duck's back. Why don't we change our mentality and let's call them catch basins? Let's hold on to the water. Let's create dams and create ponds and hold on to it because we can actually change our water cycle. The water cycle is one of the most important things I'm managing on my ranch. Um, I told you before I don't own a tractor. I will admit I bought a backhoe a few years back. So it's kind of like a tractor, but I've, I think I've moved like two bales with it in, with the front end. I, I use it for water management. 
I pretend I'm the beaver. I go out and I dam things up and I block areas and I create water sources. Okay? To me, that's, that's an important part of my, my landscape. Um, biodiversity starts with water and the beaver is one of my best friends. Okay? Uh, I call him Bob the beaver, he's always working for me, one of my employees. So. Harvesting sunlight. Okay? We gotta try and capture as much sunlight as we can. Uh, there's a ter term called albedo. It's the difference between the amount of uh, light coming towards you and the amount that's reflected. Okay, so in this case, it's from the sun. You want to increase your albedo. Okay, and that's a different term than libido, by the way. <laughs> Although when my albedo is high, so is my libido. No, um, I heard a phrase here a while ago. Sunlight travels 93 million miles to get here. 93 million miles. <coughs> Don't waste it in the last six inches. Okay, hold on to it. Have green living plant material there to absorb it and get it into, into your system. That's free money right there coming at you. So harvest as much sunlight as you can. Uh, shoulder seasons, right? That's springtime. Are you capturing sunlight in the spring? Right, uh, a, a grain field. No, it's not because there's nothing there. There's nothing going. It, they have to seed it, and uh, then it starts to, to capture some sunlight. Do we have some cover crops on those shoulder seasons, spring and fall? Forages or perennials? Great. We're, we're we're capturing as much as we can. I want to recycle as much nutrients as I can. Right. I want those cattle out there moving, or sheep, or goats, or whatever you've got. I want them recycling nutrients as much as we can. That 97. 0.5%, I don't want to be exporting it. How do you figure out on your farm or ranch is to keep as much of that as you possibly can? Oops, I'm going to uh, Building biology, I really work hard at this, riparian areas, getting as many, you know, trying to build that ecosystem up as I can. Most problems or, or, or pests or diseases that we get in agriculture, they're a symptom. They're a symptom of an unbalanced system. So my goal is to balance the system all the time and that's usually with biology. Um, and I want to develop a polyculture. That polyculture is so important in agriculture, we've gone the wrong direction. Right? We've, got to, we've got to get away from the monoculture, that's, that's what's killing us. Get back into the polyculture. Um, there's some grain farmers that I'm working with and that I've been dealing with over the years, they're doing some wonderful things with polycultures. Okay? And still getting some phenomenal yields and, and crops out of their cash crop, so it is possible. The biggest step forward that we can do in climate change, in carbon sequestration, whatever you want to call it, is to get the 10,000 acre grain farmer on board. Right? You and I on our pastures, we can do small improvements. We're already, we already have a pasture, we can do small improvements. But to get those big, big grain farmers on board, man, we can make a lot of difference there. So that's actually my goal right now is I'm trying to talk to as many grain farmers as I can. So that's kind of the why, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, the how is my, my five grazing concepts. Um, I gotta manage the grace period and the rest period. We have a funding program in Canada right now that's actually I'm really excited about. I'm not usually excited about funding programs, but this one I, mean, I am. They're putting some money in some really good places. One is uh, improved grazing management, which they've done a little bit of that before, but not much. Uh, the other one is increased use of cover crops so that's going to hit those grain farmers that's great and the uh, improved management of nitrogen fertilizer okay another one for the grain farmers i'm all for it all for it that's great um, so they're finally putting some money into this but in this program in the grazing part of it i helped design they asked me well what's the bare minimum what do you got to do as a grazer to 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 be able to get this money we got to set a bar. We got to set a set a point. Number of acres. Number of cows per acre. Uh, I couldn't do it. I couldn't come up with that. So I said the bare minimum I came up with was usually because Canada is so diverse. We've got such a different environment. It's really dry, really wet, really hot, really cold. Um, I said, okay, the bare minimum for me, if they're going to get approved for this funding, is they have to stop the second bite. You prove to me in your environment how you're managing your grazing to stop the second bite. I'll approve you for the funding. So I'm on the committee that approved the, all this funding. $200 million went into this program. So that's a lot of money going into these three programs. 
Um, so that's what we did. We got to stop the second bite, and that's the grace period and rest period. Right? You've got to manage the grace period short enough so that they're not out there too long to be able to take that second bite, and your rest period has to be long enough for your environment that your plants are fully recovered so that the animals again are not taking that second bite. Okay, so that was my bare minimum. Because in Quebec, they can have a rest period of 20 days because it's wet and hot and it grows really fast. Southern Saskatchewan, you might need a rest period of 365 days because it's so dry. Okay, so we've got some extreme environments that we, I still had to have the same program. So that's what I came up with. So grace period and rest period is really important. Animal impact's really important. I'm not gonna go into major details on this, but there's a physical part of that, the physical stimulation by their hooves, and there's the biological part. Okay, getting that urine, getting that manure, getting the phlegm and everything. Um, stock density, how intense they are, and this afternoon we're gonna talk about the economics behind stock density, right? How intense should you be? Sometimes economics manages that for you. Uh, and soil armor, leaving that cover, that's really important to, to to keep your uh, system solid. So, um, what do I do? There's so many different schools of thought on grazing, right? I learned from a lot of experts over the years, a lot of different schools. I do a little bit of everything. I change. Change to me is a tool. One year I might have a really short uh, rest period and, and be aggressive, and another year I might make a longer rest period because things change, our environment changes. And I believe that change can actually stimulate your plants and your soil as well. So change is an important part. Sometimes I'm managing for the lab, sometimes I'm managing for the animals, and sometimes I manage for the people. Okay, I might change what I'm doing and how I'm doing it because of one of those three things. Okay, so I don't do the same thing all the time. It's not a rest. And the key to this, don't get stuck in a new paradigm. Right? You get out of your old paradigm and you got something new, and then you might get stuck in the new one. Because change is a tool. Change is something that we have to, uh, you know, I, most people are scared of change, but we have to hold on to it. It's, it's got to be something, it's got to be a part of our, our decision making. Okay. Um, if you guys want, you can follow on Facebook or YouTube. We're trying to get some other social media going, but uh, those are the main ones. Uh, anybody heard of Wednesday Night Networking? It's a session that we started up when COVID hit, and uh, you're welcome to join it. It's free for everybody. I've been volunteering my time for four, 